Hello, my quilting friends. I'm Leah Day, a professional quilter, author, and online teacher. And this podcast is all about quilting, running a creative business, and balancing our busy hands with our busy lives. You can find the episode show notes and links to everything mentioned in this podcast at leahday.com. Enjoy the show. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 16 of the podcast. And today I have an exciting interview with Vicki Holloway. And her website is mycreativecorner3.wordpress.com. And we're going to talk a lot about getting things done, good time management, how to stay organized, and how to do a lot of things at once. Uh, Vicki is uh, a full time, she has a full time job. Uh, she's also a long armor. She uh, blogs daily, I think, uh, if not almost every day. And that is a lot of stuff to do all at once. So I'm super impressed by all that she gets done. And I learned a lot from this interview. Uh, it's been a few weeks since we talked and I've already incorporated a lot of her tips into my life. And that has been super, super helpful. Uh, and I'll be honest, I'm not good at all of this stuff. Uh, I get a lot done, but kind of by the seat of my pants. Uh, and so talking to Vicki was really good because I think that's gonna help me uh, get ahead and stop flying by the seat of my pants and stop feeling uh, kind of so distracted and disorganized all the time. So I really enjoyed speaking with her. And we also shared a collaboration this month and I really hope that you come and check it out. Uh, Vicki shared a tutorial on improv piecing and made a little block and sent it to me. And then I took it and did improv quilting over the surface. And I love how this turned out. It was, it was really hard <laughs> to send this quilt back to Vicki. I was like, I almost want to keep it. So maybe I need to just stop and piece one up for myself uh, and, and have something sweet for the wall. So uh, it was a lot of fun and turned out a great video, a great tutorial on her website, a great video on my website. So uh, I really hope that you check out both of those. I'll make sure to link them up at the show notes. And speaking of show notes, we finally have a home for this podcast. So you can come and find all the episodes in one easy to find place. And that is going to be at leahday.com slash podcast. So that's where you can find a player where you can binge listen to all the episodes at once. And we have 16 episodes now. So several hours of quilting listening enjoyment for you. So you can check that out at leahday.com slash podcast. Uh, so a few updates about what's going on around the house. Uh, last, let's see, I guess it was two weeks ago, I talked a lot about applique and trying to make up my mind about what type of applique to use on this new series of quilt patterns that I'm working on. And ultimately I decided on fusible web. Uh, and, you know, I went back and forth a lot. I tried a lot of different things but it makes the most sense to go with fusible web applique because I already know I'm going to be machine stitching down the edges of the applique to secure it. And it does not make sense to me to spend the time to turn the edge of the fabric just to stitch over it with the machine, you know, just to go over it with the decorative stitch or something. I still need to decide how I want to handle the thread color. Uh, so whether to always match the decorative stitch along the edge of the applique with the same color of thread or to use a contrasting color of thread or to use the color of thread I use in the quilting predominantly, which is white. Uh, so I want to do a little bit more testing <laughs> in order to figure this out. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I think is important for any designer to come up with her own style. And whenever I started quilting with white thread, at first it was just simply because I kind of had to uh, in order for the quilting designs to show up in the videos. And then along the way, that started becoming my favorite way to see texture. I wanted to see a very strong contrast and I liked the way the fabric color uh, showed through the white thread. It was almost like they were, they were two separate things, but they kind of worked together. And so I'm leaning towards appliqueing with white thread too. So I, I wanna play with that and just see how that looks. 
and and see how that goes. Uh, I haven't had time to test it yet, but it's on my list, you know, and, and I love this podcast because now that I've said it, I have to do it. <laughs> In the next two weeks, I have to carve out the time to go and play with this and give it a try. Uh, otherwise, I am not moving ahead on my goals. So uh, I have to go try it now and, and come up with a solution or at least um, I have a direction to test something else. If it doesn't end up working and I don't like it, then to have another thing to think of and to try out. So I'm looking forward to that and spending a lot of time on these goddess quilts. And in order to have that time, I've got to get ahead on the machine quilting block party. And this is one of those things, I hope that you guys enjoy seeing the kind of behind the scenes of my business a little bit more with this podcast because I know it can seem like magic if you're just watching the videos and I'm just coming out with new videos and they're just coming out every week. Uh, but really there's a lot of behind the scenes that goes into that. And with the machine quilting block party this year and last year, I was really working kind of one block at a time, one month at a time and filming those as I went. And so it was always a juggle of like, okay, when do I find the time to go shoot that piecing video? And when do I find the time to shoot the quilting video? And I have to have both of those done before the pattern comes out. So it's like a lot of behind the scenes management that goes into that. Um, that can be a little frustrating um, what, as I'm trying to do other things throughout the year, you know, as I'm trying to also write a book or create a workshop or something else. and the priorities always seem like, I don't know, it always seems a big giant question, right? Like, what is the most important thing to do right this second? And so often it is not what I really want to be doing, uh, what I really want to be focusing on. And so to solve that issue, uh, I am getting ahead on the machine quilting block party for this year. I'm already thinking about what I want to do for next year and already starting to annoy Josh a little bit <laughs> with constant question. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? You know, he's kind of like make a decision and go with it. And it's March. Why are we talking about this? You know, that kind of thing. But I mean, it is a big deal. Um, the machine quilting block party is about 30% of our business. So pretty huge chunk. And, uh, you know, the success of that really makes or breaks our year. Uh, when I've done unsuccessful quilt alongs, uh, it has made the whole year tight and stressful. When I have done mega successful quilt alongs, then it has also made the year <laughs> chaotic and stressful. You know, I mean, it's a double-edged sword uh, of, you know, hustle, hustle for the good times and also hustle through the bad times. And, you know, yes, business goes up and business goes down. It is it is the fact of anybody's business that, you know, kind of the decisions that I make today can definitely affect things in the future. Not that that's not a lot of pressure. Uh, and that's the thing I think that kind of gets me stuck sometimes is the pressure of feeling like if I make the wrong choice, then, you know, um, I don't know, I guess a lot of regret comes into that. Like, oh man, I should have made a better choice. I should have gone with something more traditional or uh, I should have gone with something more graphic or more modern or, you know, whatever. Um, and the thing that I've learned uh, having done quilt alongs now, I guess we've been doing these since 2012. So five years running some sort of year long project. I've learned that doing the same thing over and over again, while it feels safe, it is also boring. Um, it's also not a guarantee of success. Even when I do something very similar to a previous year, uh, you know, people can get bored, you know, so that's not always a positive thing. Uh, trying something brand new is terrifying, but it is thrilling when it works out and, and does well, uh, you know, and, and it's all of it is a catch 22. So I don't think it's a bad idea to start thinking about this right now in March and be focusing in on that and trying to answer those questions and, and do some soul searching about where I wanna go with it. Um, I love the format of what we've been doing for the last two years. You know, it's been a, a piece or applique block uh, with a full laid out quilting design. You know, all of that has been done for you and um, a lot of graphic design, a lot of um, diagrams go into it, a lot of photos go into it. But it's, it's been really good because it seems to be answering a lot of those beginner questions and getting people quilting. That's the point. You know, that's my whole goal. Uh, 
the flip side of it is uh, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work to put that together. And, uh, and it is very disheartening whenever I get on my group and someone's like, well, I wasn't going to join, but, you know, like that, but <laughs> it's like, yay, you've joined in, but you didn't like it. You know, there's that. Uh, anyway, I'm not complaining. It's just, uh, please understand that I do read almost all the comments and sometimes my feelings get hurt. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't av avoid that. Uh, at the same time though, I know that not everything is going to appeal to everyone. You know, um, a very traditional quilt's not going to appeal to a modern quilter. A, uh, you know, a super um, artistic quilt is not going to appeal to a traditional quilter, you know, and I've got to kind of figure it out, you know, what's going to appeal to the widest range, but also make me happy. And that's what I'm trying to answer that question for this year. So that's what I've been working on a lot this week. Just, you know, really kind of blazing through videos knocking them out. Uh, my friend who is a, a, a yoga instructor, uh, she says, picking them up and putting them down. That's what I've been doing. I've been picking them up and putting them down uh, whenever we walk together. That's what she says. And it always makes me smile. Uh, it's just basically, it uh, means, you know, you are actively moving forward, you know, just putting in the work. And that's so important. And speaking of putting in the work, I've also made progress on my walking foot book. My third chapter is complete and that was, it's honestly been the chapter I've rewritten more times than all the others. It's the chapter with all the designs in it. And I gotta say, it's really hard to write a, a book about quilting designs because so often I feel like, God, this is reading so boring. You know, this is like quilt from edge to edge with a straight line. I mean, it, it just, it really does start reading very dull by the, like 15 jillion design uh, and, and I felt very repetitive. So I went back through and tried to figure out creative ways of instructing with the designs so that it wasn't just basically the same text over and over and over again. Uh, and then I know that I'll be doing a lot of stuff with photos to explain these things, you know, or diagrams. Um, and so when I got stuck, I, I asked Josh to read it. And he was like, I'm not, I don't wanna read it, but I'll just give you some advice. And that is simplify, you know, simplify it down. If you can say something once, say it once, figure out where you can say it once and, uh, and simplify it down. Even if you don't write that much about each individual design, write something short, you know, like what makes that design unique. And another thing that really helped was I sat down with the design squares. I've already stitched these out into individual squares and I just sat down with them and kind of just touched the blocks. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I just, I just sat with the quilting for a little while and that kind of helped, uh, you know, it helped me tune back into why I'm doing this and why I love these textures and, uh, and why these designs are important to learn. And that was, that was good. Uh, and I think it's a solid chapter now and I don't have to go back and rewrite it, which is a relief. I'm tired of, of trying to stumble my way through that. And the good thing is, is that I feel like now that it's written, it can be edited. And if I want to add, I can add. If I want to take away, I can take away. But it's done. It's written. And, and the text was put down on the page. And then anything that happens from now on, at least I won't have to start over again. You know, and that's a relief. The next chapter is going to be pretty tough. It is all of the quilting designs in the book. The, yeah, sorry, not quilting designs, all the quilt designs. So there's seven quilts in the book and they've also been kind of a mess, kind of all in separate pieces. And so pulling that together is going to be an effort, but I'm going to sit down and kind of do it all in like two or three days is kind of how I plan to do it. I'm going to break out two or three days from my schedule and just say, today is a book day. And I'll probably will bring it out here in the crafty cottage and crank up the heater and, um, and just not be interrupted. You know, that's the nice thing about having the crafty cottage. I would say the number one thing is, uh, it is my space to create without interruption. And the guys are very respectful of that. And they know that if they come out here, they could potentially be messing up a video, which makes me angry. So, um, so they very rarely interrupt me. And even if I'm not filming a video, they still respect that time and that space. So 
I'm, I'm, that's what my plan is. I, I actually reorganized, um, kind of rearranged a whole section of the Crafty Cottage, the area that's kind of behind the scenes. It's behind my backdrop, so you never see it in the videos. Uh, and it's always been really junky. And I will share one of the videos that I, I did it like a Crafty Cottage tour a few months ago. And so I'll share that so you can see. Basically, I took out the whole back table, which was always covered in junk and uh, I took all the junk inside. So it's now filling up another room, that's okay. Uh, I will go through it eventually and actually sift through all of that stuff. But most of it was just, I you know put a quilt together and bring it out here with some sort of plan to film something on it, but then I just never got around to it. And then it would just get shoved into a pile and never stitched and, and nothing ever happened with it. So uh, I pulled all that stuff out, uh, took down that table and then found a collapsible desk on Amazon. Um, unfortunately, a, a piece or two is broken out of it that I will have to repair, but it got on the wall and it looks okay. And the cool thing about this desk is in order to sit down in it, the desk has to be collapsed. And in order to get up from the desk, the desk has to be collapsed. Now, that might sound a little weird, but this is who I am. I am a clutter bug. And if there is a tabletop or a flat surface, it will be covered in clutter in no time. And then it will no longer be a desk for me to write at. But if it has to be collapsed for me to sit down in the chair and then use it, <laughs> then obviously the surface has to be clean. And then in order for me to you know, get up from the chair, I have to also collapse it. The surface has to be clean. I know this sounds weird, you know, not everyone will need this kind of thing, but I did. So, uh, you know, I built it and I built it that way with, with my own quirks in mind. And I think it's really gonna work well. Uh, and I can come out here with an iPad and a keyboard and just nail through these chapters and, and get it done. And then not leave a mess behind. You know, I can sit down, do my writing, kind of put myself in jail. And while I'm doing that writing process, so I can't be distracted, I can't go do something else, I can't go check Instagram, you know, I'm gonna turn off the Wi-Fi on my phone or my iPad, so I, I only can do that one thing. And I think that's really important. Uh, I've been reading the book Deep Work, and I like it. There's pieces of it that I'm, I don't necessarily agree with, um, such as, you know, if you completely disengage and turn off the internet completely, then how will you build, build a following? How will anyone know who you are? You know, all that stuff. So I don't agree with everything this guy says, but I do agree with developing a practice of deep concentration and developing a practice of, uh, of uninterrupted time to work. And, and this is why I put this desk out here, you know, honestly, so that uh, in the house, I know that at any given time, James will wander into my room and I, you know, I want to stop for him. I want to stop for hugs and stuff, but uh, if I want to get my work done, I've got to, I've got to develop that deep work habit and separate myself, you know, and, and, you know, have that time to go and get the work done and finished. And I think this will really help me move a lot faster on these projects and that feels good too. So that's pretty much it for everything I've been working on. Um, definitely check out the Set Down Sundays. I posted two, let's see here, yes, two in the last time. Uh, one on uh, really dense quilting, so you might wanna check out that. And then the other video is on adjusting your foot to the right height. And this is you know, specifically geared to set down quilting on a long arm quilting machine, but you know, it, a lot of these tips do apply to a home sewing machine as well, as far as speed control and watching out for skip stitches and all that good stuff. So definitely check those out. I'm really happy with this new series and it's generating a lot of interest and uh, a lot of people are intrigued. And, you know, I know in the past that I've put up posts about, you know, seven reasons why I don't need a long arm. <laughs> I really need to update that. And, uh, and share a new post, you know, seven reasons why I now want a long arm. Uh, but basically, prices have come down. They're much more affordable. And uh, for having the extra space, it does make quilting so much easier. It makes it feel so much easier, less uh, strain, less difficulty on your body. 
And then uh, eventually, once I get this walking foot book done, I am going to put up a frame somewhere in the house and start playing with that type of quilting, uh, mostly just because I'm intrigued as to how it works and, and how different that style of quilting is in comparison to others. Uh, and, and then also, you know, how do you get started on it? How different is that from quilting on a stationary machine? And I think there's upsides and downsides to both, you know, both styles of quilting. And uh, one big thing that I'm definitely planning on using my frame for is basting my quilts. That I've, I've been renting time on a long arm locally, and that's what I've mostly used it for, is basting the layers of a quilt together using water-soluble thread. It's so much faster, it's so much easier, it does not break my back, and, uh, and then the quilt is super, super secure, so it's not gonna shift uh, no matter how you quilt it. So I really like that. And, and I think this is a good direction. It's one of those things I always get criticism no matter, you know, what I decide to do. Someone, someone's always going to say, you know, uh, oh, well, you should stay with the domestic. You know, you should stay with home sewing machines. Um, but, the, you know, the thing I come back to is I have shot a thousand videos. One thousand videos. If that's not enough <laughs> to teach you quilting on a home sewing machine, I don't know what is, you know. So it is okay for me to innovate and to try new things. And, uh, and I will continue to share videos uh, quilting on a home sewing machine too. This is just adding something else I can shoot videos on, you know, something else I can share uh, more people to reach and to connect with. And that's always a good thing. You know, that's what I'm always looking forward to is, is just helping and connecting with more quilters and helping more people get started. That's always my goal. So that's pretty much it for today. Our sponsor for the show, is the machine quilting block party. We are in our third month. Uh, so we have three beautiful blocks for you to get started with. You can start any time during the year, but now is a great time to get started because you can start with your three blocks. You can really get the feel for piecing and machine quilting. And the blocks are just $4.99 each. And we also have a bonus sashing and cornerstones pattern so that you can make your quilt bigger if you choose. So find all of those blocks and get started today at leahday.com slash block party. And now here's the show. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Vicki Holloway, a quilting teacher, long armor, and full-time blogger at My Creative Corner 3. Welcome to the show, Vicki. Hi, Leah. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. I have a little bit of a cold, so that's why I sound a little off today. Uh, but let's just get started just talking about uh, how you got into quilting and uh, kind of where your journey started. Sure. I really started young. My mother was a sewing crafty lady, and when all of my aunts started having babies, we decided that quilting was something that was a tradition in our family. So we made little baby quilts for our cousins. And then I took a hiatus until I got pregnant. And then I decided it was a great tradition to continue. So I, I did most of my quilting as an adult starting in my 20s. Excellent. And so I take it that you have a lot of baby, the different baby quilt patterns. Uh, did you make a whole lot of those? We actually did um, what my great-grandmother did, squares, just five-inch squares, and then we hand-tied them. But when I had my baby, I wanted to jump right in with a story that's yours. I wanted a double wedding ring quilt, and I was, like, going to do it, and I had a friend, and I'm like, oh, no way. Four rings, and that was it, because it was way beyond my skill set. Yeah, you know, it's been 13 years. I still haven't made the double wedding ring yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So how did you turn this into a business? You're a, a long armor now and you're a, a blogger. I consider, you know, anyone that's blogging more than three or four times a week is a full-time blogger. So how did you, how did you get into that and start sharing that online? Well, I live in a very small rural community, and there are some people who do quilting, and I was having trouble connecting with them, and that's where it started. Blogging was my way of connecting with people outside of my little town, and the long arming evolves over time because my mother actually wanted to learn how to long arm, and I was very ill, and I could not physically run 
queen size quilts under a domestic machine anymore. And so that's where that idea hatched. Um, in my recovery phase, she bought a midarm and we started quilting for our friends and our family and then the next thing i know um the long arm lives at my house because my mother retired and moved to a warmer climate and um i still do a lot of quilts for friends and family and some local people excellent so the long arming you would say uh like how how many quilts do you do a year and, and what's your lead time right now I'm about eight weeks out, and I do about four to six a month. And when you're talking edge to edge, you know how custom work can get and become very, very intensive in time. But that's that's my um, part-time job outside of all my other activities that I do. But, yeah, long arming has been great for me as a way to really capture the part of quilting I enjoy the most, which is the stitching the quilt together in all of those intricate stitches. Absolutely. That's my favorite part, too. So you also have a full-time job. Like, I was checking out your website, and you work in healthcare, and so, like, you're long arming, you have a full-time job, you're a blogger. How do you do all of that? I, I really can't even wrap my brain around it. It comes from a, a space of being a working mother. A long time ago when I had children at home, I learned very quickly that if I was going to juggle balls, which is a wife, mother, and full-time worker, there's lots of hats you wear every day. So I learned that time management is number one. And if I wanted to get anything done, I had to do it in 10 or 15 minute increments. Well, that led to, well, I want to do fun things too, besides, you know, doing dishes and mopping the floors and going to work. But it turned into, I needed that time for myself. So I devised, you know, strategies to monopolize 15 minute increments or half hour increments and letting go of an idea that it's all or nothing. Because when you have that kind of attitude of approaching things, uh, at least for me, nothing got done. Because it's, if it's all or nothing, then I couldn't give it my all, then generally it was nothing. And I didn't feel happy at that point and satisfied because creativity is very important to me. And I'm a person that needs to be creating every day. So, excellent. So 10 to 15 increments, and if you, if you had 30 minutes, then you devote 30 minutes. And so do you have strategies now? Can you, can you talk us through your day and how you find that space in that time? And, and then um, for me, I get bogged down like, oh, I don't want to bother to go change my bot. I like, I make up excuses. So <laughs> can you kind of help me out with that? <laughs> oh, sure. Excuses are great because uh, they are time vampires and I've, I try to eliminate them. I look at, I start my day at the same time every day. I get up at 6 o'clock, and I have an hour and a half before I have to prepare for work. And during that time, I have already planned, usually the night before, what I'm going to sew. I usually sew a block, and then I devote um, 45 minutes to long arming. The other part of all of this is I can only do a half hour to 45 minutes of one thing at a time because I'm getting older, I have arthritis, I have a lot of other health problems, so repetitive motion of the same thing over and over is not good for people who have these kinds of orthopedic problems. So I do. I'll One block, I'll cut it out, and if I have, that's it for 15 minutes, that's all I do that day. Then I will go and do one row on the long arm. Now, the good news is at my house at 6 o'clock in the morning, my family, um, my children are grown, and my husband's already at work. So I'm not bothering people, <laughs> you know, my neighbors maybe, but not me. And then usually at lunchtime, I have the luxury of living close to home, to my studio. So I will come home from my day job, and I will do another row on the long arm in about usually 20 to 30 minutes. If that's all I can do. That's what I do. And then when I come home again in a transition time, I will finish what I started that morning. Usually in the evening after dinner, it's handwork, you know, like binding and things like that or planning for the next day. Also, evening is when I spend about, you know, half hour for blogging. And I'm a thinker. So a lot of times I'll use the 
um, app on my phone for messaging myself, you know, memoing um, what I want to talk about in my blog or what I want to do on a podcast that I'm just starting out or what I want to do for an idea of a design. That helps me keep going. But the other thing I have to say, Leah, is that I am not a chain stitching, mass cutting. No, I'm one stitch, one block, one row at a time. Because it's easy to get lost in where you want to go when you're only doing things in 10 or 15 minute increments. I try not to have too many things going at once either. That helps me. So you keep it small, you keep it, it sounds very organized. And, and like, I'm going to be working on this, and then I'm going to be working on this, and then I'm going to be work. that's awesome. So tell me about your organization system. Do you keep everything kind of organized in bins, or do you have things written down so you know what's next? Well, my sewing space is actually my dining room table. That helps me, because I'm in the center of my house. So... When I'm done with one project, I can quick sit down at the dining room table. So my sewing room is next to the dining room, and I have a tool bench in there. And on that tool bench is where my cutting table is. On the pegboard behind it is all my rulers and lighting. There's storage above it where I can put all of my interfacings and different types of papers and then next to it is an old desk that's a tall, skinny one with lots of shelves. And that's where I organize bins of current projects. The, um, the fabric, no, that is not organized. If you were to walk in there, you would probably go, how does she do this? Because it's in piles around the different spaces. But it's organized to me. I know where things are in the different stages. The one thing I do have to keep organized is like checking customers' quilts in and out. I try to have a log book and who they all belong to and have them labeled and things like that. So some organization is necessary, but most of it really, I think, is managing what I'm doing with my time. I don't spend a lot of time watching TV. I don't spend a lot of time reading anymore because I'd rather be doing. And that's just really where I chose to put all of my energy. That totally makes sense. Yeah. So many times I get the question, you know, how do you do it all? And I usually answer really simply with, I don't watch television. You know, I watch like a little show with my son every evening because it's our like, it's our time together, but I don't sit down and binge watch anything. You know, it's, you're lucky if you see me sit down for, you know, 30 minutes uh, at a time just to do that. Uh, and, and I think that's something that's so important. There's so many time sucks in our day, things that we don't even realize are taking up so much of our time. Um, you want to talk about that? Is there anything that you're like, I, nope, not doing it. (laughs) Yeah. I'll have to say, I don't like doing a lot of cooking. That is not my thing. So I don't spend hours a day preparing food, planning food, um, We have a routine in our house of uh, we shop on Saturday. We do it in a short period of time. And quite honestly, our meals are simple and easy. And, you know, since my husband and I both keep kind of different schedules, we don't always eat together. So it's easy. Um, When you're doing family planning, different story. You know, it did take a little longer when I was doing that. But still, it's simple. I keep things very simple and straightforward. Same with, um, you know, If I walk by it and I notice it needs to be done and it's a 10 to 15 second thing, I do it. Like if you walk by the trash can and it's overflowing, why walk by it four times when the first time you could have it done and over with? I do the same thing with like dishes and, you know, you walk by it. Yeah, if you're walking by the sink, go ahead and throw it in the dishwasher. It works out. And overall, I just think we have to come up with systems and because routines and systems is what keeps me going and having more time of course we all have seasons of life where we're busier than others with time being committed to other things but it's the vampires of time like spending way too much time looking at quilt designs instead of just doing it you know I used to do that a lot or scrolling through lots and lots of blogs and then getting hooked up on binge reading what happened to the person only to find out they took the blog down and I never know what happened you know those kinds of things but um 
we need some time for ourselves, and and having some to just be free is okay. But it's the uh, oh telephone. That was another thing. Now that we have text messaging, it's great. I don't have to spend an hour on the phone dealing with problems or with talking with people maybe because that's where a lot of time can go the other thing is a bluetooth headphones them they're great because i can multitask when i wear them absolutely yeah people get used to hearing the sewing machine going in the background (laughs) i am listening i promise i'm hearing you (laughs) absolutely you know that makes total sense and i like that advice too if you see it and it won't take very much time, go on ahead and do it. And I'm I'm bad about that. Like I will walk by that full trash can seventeen times and I'll look at Josh like, Can you take that out? And it's annoying me, not him. Right. <laughs> so I totally, totally understand that. I think you're gonna help me out quite a lot with this. These are a lot of really good tips. Um, so you you don't chain stitch, you don't mass cut everything out. Um, so you know, so you're you're pulling out your cutting mat. And, and your fabrics to cut uh, one block at a time, correct? Absolutely. Huh. Okay. And, yep. so tell and me... I do one block at a time for a reason, because when I try to mass cut blocks, I make mistakes. And then you wind up wasting more time and more energy and more money because you got to go find the fabric again. So I try to do one block at a time accurately do it right the first time, the old things we used to get in time management class. And that's how, how I work. Um, yeah, I do improvisational piecing sometimes, so you got a little more room of making um, mistakes. And quite honestly, improv takes way longer to do that for me because I have to do a lot of design planning on the fly versus having a pattern that you follow. But you can st- I still do them one block at a time. And then if you want to make design changes as you go, you're not committed that you just cut 500 pieces out that you may or may not use ever. And so that's part of why I started doing that. It was more I made less mistakes, and it cost me less in the long run in both time, energy, and money. That makes total sense. It really does. Um, So tell me about your blog and how you manage that. Because uh, it sounds like most of your morning time and your lunch time is really devoted to like hopping on the long arm or cutting something out or piecing something. So tell me about how you manage your blog. I do have um, ideas usually several times a week. And it's like an update of what I'm doing, a diary of quilts that I have just taken off the frame. Uh, because quite honestly, I have a bad memory. A year from now, a customer may come to me and say, hey, do you remember that log cabin quilt? Will you do exactly what you did on it last time? And even if I have a note, because I do everything free motion, sometimes I don't remember what I did or what color the thread was. And so that's part of what I blog about. Um, I do blog a little bit about my personal life and our adventures, because that's Part of where blogging started for me was my children moved away from home, and it's a way for us to read back and forth on how we're doing and what we're doing. And that I do have themes, though. Periodically throughout the year, I cycle through different themes. And summer is usually devoted to my husband's um, Highland Games and travel, so I talk about all the festivals. And winter is no travel for us. We get a hundred inches of snow or more a year. So I'm homebound on weekends. So I talk about creativity because that's when I do most of my design work. And our local quilt guild does a 100 day project. And this year I decided I didn't want to devote a hundred days to it. I just want to do 30. And it's really an exercise in daily, really looking at things differently. How can you make something different than what you did the day before? And I think blogging helps with that because it helps me look at things through a different lens and try to creatively present everyday life in not a real boring way. Because otherwise, you know, I kind of do the same things that we do every year. And we want to keep in touch with family and friends and those who choose to read the blog, but I don't want to bore them to tears either. (laughs) So that's how I manage the blog. I take a lot of pictures and pictures help me 
be more creative. And so that's kind of how it all melded into, you know, this blogging world. You know, I started a long time ago. And but it's now more than just my life. It's it's really more about creativity and design and all the different goofy things we do every day. I totally see that. And I love um, your your daily creative prompt. You said that came out of the Quilt Guild. You want to talk about that a little bit and how people can join in? Yes, it, it came out of an idea that I had our local arts council actually doing this 100-day project. It's, a, it's kind of a big thing at local art guilds in the Midwest. And it is really a taking time every day to create. Now, most of the people who do that are painters and into fine arts, but there's several of us who are quilters. And so I thought, well, why don't we take this February, the month of winter doldrums, where we all get creatively stuck here in northern Michigan, and start looking at, well, what can we do every day that's different? So the first couple of days were fun things, like where do you sit? Where's your spot? Uh, one day was stack up seven things. Um, the other thing is um, draw a hundred circles. And it's just to jumpstart a day of thinking about something differently. Um, I do have an Instagram account, and I've put daily pictures of the things I've done. And people can also join me on the Facebook group, My Creative Corner 3, where we're talking about um, the challenges of uh, finding a rock in February under all the snow was kind of hard for some people, but most of us have rocks in the house. So people, it's amazing what they're coming up with creatively with a prompt is totally not what you would think. Um, stack, one of my friends did a stack of seven poetry quotes that she liked. So it was just really, it's really been a great thing. And the people who are creatively stuck are telling me they started quilting again because they just needed something to jumpstart that spark in the brain. So that's how the Daily Creative Prompt Challenge started. And I think I'm going to continue it next month and we'll just keep going and see how the interest goes. And then, um, because I think I subconsciously do it anyway every day and I thought well maybe more people would join me and find it to be kind of a different lens a different thing but it's also kind of silly like one day we're going to do something like um, doodle and then color the doodle we can be as silly and as childlike as you want but that's sometimes where I need to go to be creative again Oh, I completely understand. Sometimes um, I find myself going, you know, it doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so serious, you know, lighten it up already. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting what you said about having different cycles throughout the year, but then overall we're all kind of doing the same thing. And I so relate to that. And I am one of those types of people. I like chaos. Like it, it kind of makes me feel alive to have some chaos going on. Uh, and so how I do that is by doing some kind of remodel through it. You know, at, at some point during the year, I tear up a part of my house and then rebuild it. <laughs> so uh, that's how I kind of dig into that a little bit. Do you have anything like that where it's like, oh, I've got to do this thing, you know, or I've got to mess things up or are you more the opposite way? You like it to be kind of the same all the time. I'm, I'm more of an orderly introvert who likes to just keep things the same. But where I get my chaos is we travel a lot in the summer. And so that disrupts my routine. But also is great because I meet all kinds of people and I see new things and I get to experience new places. So uh, that's where my chaos comes. I'm, I'm kind of a routine. Every day has its, its structure and rhythm and flow. I mean, I go to bed at the same time. I get up at the same time. But that's how my life functions better. I'm never uh, all night will get that thing done by seven in the morning person I will sew my finger and that will be the end of the day so you know chaos for me is not good I'm I'm finding though that what I need is creative stimulus which comes from seeing and doing different things and going different places when I was young though we couldn't go anywhere we didn't have enough money for gas so we, we had to come up with ways to find that and Locally, we're lucky that there's lots of places in a short trip that we could go experience 
and take our kids to and re-experience with the kids. So that helped keep it fresh. Yeah, shake it up a little bit, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I, I I'm completely agree. I like um I like that you said the word system because that's a word that really works for me now. It's uh it's not just a series of habits. It's all of them together that form the system that make your life work. Uh, so, you know, if you could look at the, the many different things that you use to organize your life, what would you say are like the top three most important? The top three is having a schedule. I mean, I do have a schedule. My work has a schedule. My life revolves around scheduling. But also with the rigid schedule, we also have to be mentally flexible to know that some days it's all going to fall apart and you have to, on the fly, reprioritize what you have to do right now. So I would have to say calendars and um, alarms on a cell phone, um, those kinds of time management tools help me a lot. And then the third thing is I do keep a list. I, I keep a list of what I need to do, and it's usually in the sidebar of a paper calendar or it'll be hanging on my tool bench in, in my sewing area where I can cross it off and then I feel really good. And post-it notes. I love post-it notes. I hope that post-it notes never, ever, ever go out of style because when I'm done, I rip them up and thread them and then it's symbolic to me that it's done, but it also solidifies in my mind that task is complete. So I use electronic and paper ways of organizing. That is super cool. I love the, just the idea of ripping it up. I am a note taker and I am a list maker just like you, but then I end up with all these little bits of paper all over my desk and I never do anything with them. And I have to actually like really study them and go, okay, I can throw that one away now. <laughs> this might be three weeks old. So that's such a good piece of advice to rip it up once you know it's done right then. And that way it's not hanging around. Um, okay. So I think that's pretty much all the questions that I had about how you time, you know, keep everything managed and organized. Uh, the last question I always like to ask everyone is what are you most looking forward to? in the next five years? Like, you know, you're building all of these different things, you're blogging, you've got this long arm business, but in the next five years, a big chunk of time, what's the mm -hmm. thing you're excited about the most? Well, I had, I actually have a five year plan and I think my, my whole hope is maybe have a couple of patterns ready to print and I have a lot of ideas and working on workshops and I want to teach other people this wonderful world of creativity because I think a lot of people are getting lost in electronics and they just don't really know that we can still do so much and that so many people are out there who are willing to share. So those are three things that I really want to do is, you know, teaching and patterns and just continuing on with the blog and, and all of that and hoping that I still have ideas to write about in five years. <laughs> Most certainly. I bet you will. Ha you know, I, I, what I found, at least with my blog, is actually the first couple of months were the hardest. And then everything after that, it almost became easier because it's like, oh, I want to riff on that again. You know, and you could always go back and say, hey, I need to pull that post out and readdress it. And then you can link back to it, too. So that I think it's an, an ever, ever growing fountain of knowledge and, and creativity. Definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Vicki, for joining us. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Sure. My blog is at mycreativecorner3.wordpress.com. And on the sidebar of my blog has my Instagram and Twitter account. And also My Creative Corner 3 is a Facebook group where we talk about the daily creative prompt challenge. Excellent. Well, I hope everybody will come and check out your stuff and join in the daily creative prompt. I definitely will check it out and start using that to kind of fuel my creativity too. So oh, thank you, Leah. Yeah, thank you for coming. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. You can find a player that will play through all of the episodes of this podcast shared so far at leahday.com slash podcast. 
There you'll also find links to the show notes for every single episode we've shared so far. So you can check out and learn more about every guest that we've interviewed. If you have any questions, please contact us at leahday.com slash contact. I'm also interested in any new suggestions for interviews or people to talk to or topics for the show. So share your ideas at leahday.com slash contact. Until next time, let's go quilts.